I'm John Cooper. I'm consultant veterinary pathologist to Jersey Wildlife Preservation Trust, uh, which is in the British Channel Isles off the coast of France. I'd like first to acknowledge the support of um, Jersey Wildlife Preservation Trust, in particular my veterinary colleagues Tony Allchurch and Chris Dutton. I'd also like to thank Carl Jones and Jamie Samore for use of a couple of their slides in this presentation. Uh, the subject is uh, pathology of raptors, and if we look at the first slide, please, um, I shall be alternating between the use of the word raptor and the word, bird, uh, the word birds of prey. Um, as far as this lecture is concerned, they mean exactly the same. Uh, what are raptors? What are birds of prey? Well, they, are, they consist of two different orders of birds, very different orders in terms of their taxonomy, um, but uh, very similar, the birds in these two groups, in, insofar as their, um, their behavior, particularly their feeding behavior, is concerned. And they are lumped together as raptors or birds of prey. The order Strigiformes, the owls, which are essentially nocturnal birds of prey, and the order Falconiformes, which are hawks, eagles, and falcons, most of which are diurnal. Now, there has been a long association of human beings with, um, with birds of prey, and they've played a very important part in the, in the tradition and the culture and, and, and uh, customs of many different cultures. Uh, in Europe, for example, we have uh, uh, been familiar with falconry for a long period of time. This is the Bayer Tapestry, which um, was produced 900 years ago to commemorate the uh, invasion of England by the French by William the Conqueror. And here you see, see us have a scene from the Bayer Tapestry of the Norman soldiers getting into their boat. You can see the water here, and they're just going across to England to invade. And they're not only uh, ready to fight the war, but they're taking their dogs and their trained hawks. So that's 900 years ago. And that is just one example of the role that has been played by birds of prey, certainly in European uh, life, for many hundreds of years. And we see it also with the Strigiformes, with the owls. This, for example, is from, the, uh, from uh, Dijon in France, and it's one of the churches in, in Dijon which has a carved owl, a chouette, on the wall. And this has been there for several hundred years, must have been put in by the stonemason when the, when the cathedral was built and is very much revered by lo local people and always has been as a sign of good luck, good fortune. And yet again, it's a bird of prey, and uh, I think this is, is, is relevant. But of course, birds of prey are very important in the wild. Um, different species of birds of prey play a key part in many ecosystems, and in particular, birds of play, prey are very uh, significant and, and, and very Im important in terms of uh, uh, our investigation of them um, when it comes to food chains. This is one example of a food chain, and in each of these we've got, uh, we've got owls at the top of the food chain here, through shrews down to, to wood lice and other invertebrates, and this one here up through microorganisms, flies, spiders, birds, up to hawks. So uh, birds of prey are at the top of many different food chains, and this makes them very important environmental sentinels, and one reason why they've attracted uh, a lot of information in, in recent years. Now, interest in the health and disease of birds of prey is also um, a, a, a not particularly new. Um, 300 years ago, uh, one of a number of books that appeared in the English language on falconry not only described the diseases of falcons, but also uh, depicted, as you can see here, the instruments that could be used for cauterizing lesions and for excising uh, lesions, in other words, actual treatment of clinical disease. But interest in the pathology and the causes of death of, of, of birds of prey is relatively recent. It actually goes back to the uh, 60s and in the subsequent years um, when uh, the decline in many species of birds of prey, uh, the peregrine falcon, for example, in many parts of the world um, was a cause of great alarm. Uh, investigations were carried out. Chlorinated hydrocarbon insecticides were implicated in, in in most of these, uh, in most of these incidents, etc. Um, but the interest in um, birds of prey, the reasons for their decline, uh, etc., uh, led to um, not only to toxicological investigations, but also increased involvement by avian pathologists in ascertaining the other factors that might contribute to um, to changes in population in these different species. 
More recently, there has been interest in the role of disease in wild free-living raptor populations in terms of uh, spread of populations, population decline, etc. For instance, the, uh, the goshawk shown here is one of a, a group from the um, colony of, of goshawks in, um, in uh, free-living goshawks in Scotland, where, there, uh, where disease, clinical disease occurred, where it was quite obvious that this was hampering the spread, the return of the goshawk to Scotland. It originally became extinct there 100 years ago. Um, our investigations uh, showed that this was due to trichomonas, trichomonas gallinae. This is a cytological preparation, but you can see amongst the epithelial cells, lots of bacteria here, but you can see trichomonads with their flagella very, very clearly. And trichomonas was implicated here as a limiting factor in the uh, success and the spread of this particular species. And at the same time, there's been uh, an explosion of interest in, in uh, the causes of morbidity and mortality in captive birds of prey. And uh, that has been the case whether they, these birds are kept in zoological collections, private hands, or rehabilitation centers. So there has been over the past decade, two decades perhaps, ample opportunity for veterinary pathologists to become involved with raptors, both free living raptors and those in captivity, and to make useful contributions uh, to our understanding of disease processes and uh, how these might, um, might affect uh, survival and success of these species. The pathologist's role is, in my view, not just confined to the examination of dead raptors. Pathology in its broadest sense, meaning the study, the investigation of disease, means that we should also play a part in the appropriate laboratory investigations uh, when clinical cases are involved. So the clinical examination of a raptor may well, and indeed in most cases should, be coupled with a whole range of other disciplines. We've got hematology, clinical chemistry, parasitology, microbiology, histology, cytology, possibly electromicroscopy, possibly radiology, and DNA studies and so on. And many of those that are listed there are ones in which I feel the avian pathologist, the veterinary pathologist, should take the lead, uh, and indeed in many cases is already doing that. Thus, for example, if a bird is presented, a raptor is presented to a veterinarian, here we have a, a lana falcon, um, clearly uh, not well, it doesn't look very well, it's uh, been presented with a, with a history of loss of weight, etc., etc. Um, this is where, in my view, the pathologist can play a part. The pathologist can uh, supervise, perhaps carry out such things as bacteriology, virus isolation, cytological examination, hematological examination, all these, I would argue, are part of the pathologist's remit when dealing with a clinical case, a raptor that is a clinical case. And also, of course, there's the question of health monitoring of apparently healthy birds, uh, especially when they're endangered species, and especially when they're part of a species recovery program. For example, the Mauritius kestrel, uh, which uh, was uh, 20 years ago one of the rarest birds in the world, uh, has been successfully bred in a number of collections. Uh, we at Jersey Zoo have been part of that program, uh, both at the zoo and on the island of Mauritius. And here you see um, a part of uh, the health monitoring program. This is a cloacal swab being taken from one of the captive um, uh, Mauritius kestrels, just part of health monitoring screening program, apparently healthy birds, just checking the bacterial flora, etc. And here a blood sample being taken from the basilic vein for routine hematology, clinical chemistry, etc building up a database on a rare species uh, so that we have data, we have information that could be used as reference material in the event of an outbreak of disease or, or some other problem in the future. Nevertheless, in raptor work, the post-mortem examination is probably still the foundation stone of raptor pathology and investigation. And the um, the post-mortem examination of the raptor may be a diagnostic one, ascertaining the cause of, of death. It may be to ascertain what background pathology there is, and this is very often the case when it comes to health monitoring. It may be a forensic one, because raptors are so important in the ecosystem, because there is quite a lucrative trade in raptors, particularly 
falcons for falconry and so on in many countries of the world not infrequently the veterinary pathologist is asked to provide forensic um, evidence about the origin of a bird or how it was killed whether it's taken legally uh, those sort of things and so forensic is important and I put cosmetic at the bottom in inverted commas because again because of the popularity and the the, the rarity of some of these birds not infrequently uh, these birds are required for museums or for reference collections and so on and so the pathologist may have to ascertain from the outset the extent to which he or she can carry out a full examination or may in fact be limited because of the need to have the skeleton or a study skin or whatever and that always has to be borne in mind when working with these species. The other aspect I want to mention is what I call the mini necropsy because some of these birds are small and um, because one is very often looking at them or perhaps uh, small derivatives from them the mini necropsy may be very important uh, it means that one has to carry out the examination with much more precision uh, it needs uh, specialist equipment in terms of um, uh, 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 dissecting loops, um, magnifying uh, e equipment, uh, small instruments and so on because one is dealing with small samples, small specimens and really the standard post-mortem examination may not be appropriate. I use this sort of technique for example for looking at eggs of raptors. Uh, here's a, a dead in shell European kestrel. Uh, you'll get some idea from the, the rule here of how small this is and really to do a proper examination, to dissect it, to check for developmental abnormalities, syndactyly, those sort of things is really impossible in my view unless you are properly equipped and do it, as I say, uh, with equipment um, uh, for, a, for a mini necropsy. And the same goes for embryos. Here's an embryo of a European sparrowhawk uh, where um, uh, in this particular case this needed careful dissection and there was clear evidence of developmental abnormalities. Now once again the post-mortem examination of the raptor, like the clinical examination, is likely to be coupled with a lot of investigations, lab-based investigations, which I shan't list but uh, many of them are similar to those that were mentioned earlier, but in addition we have such things as examination of stomach and gut contents, chemical analysis for poisons, etc. And I would argue that all of these uh, fields, all of these on the list, are ones in which the veterinary pathologist um, should play a part and in many cases should be taking the lead uh, in the investigations. And so thus the post-mortem in this case of a, uh, a wild bird, a free-living uh, tawny owl in Britain, one showing a certain amount of post-mortem change, but nevertheless important, it was part of a survey of morbidity and mortality in free-ranging um, uh, uh, raptors is being carried out here and this I should mention it was part of a joint project between veterinary pathologists and colleagues who were toxicologists they were doing their analyses for chlorinated hydrocarbons polychlorinated biphenyls heavy metals and so on and at the same time we were taking samples for bacteriology histopathology etc uh, a good example of synergism we got a lot of good publishable results from these that neither discipline alone could have achieved a key part in my view of post-mortem examination of raptors is that of weighing the organs we we pay lip service to this in our pathology or many of us do and say yes we really should weigh organs and do uh, liver weight body weight ratios etc but it is very important in raptors um, because uh, we have increasing evidence that some sublethal um, uh, effects of, of chemicals may be associated with changes in, in, in uh, body, uh, in, in organ weight, etc. And indeed, changes in organ weight may be, re may be um, indicative of certain infectious diseases. So this sort of breakdown here, even if one can't weigh every organ because of the, n the amount of work that's necessary, I think it's very important at least to get, of course, a total weight for the bird and a liver weight and then whatever others are, are feasible at the time. Now often um, post-mortem and uh, supportive um, pathology tests will uh, support a diagnosis that perhaps has been made clinically. Uh, here's a snowy owl for example, this was actually a forensic case um, and there seemed little doubt from the clinical history that the bird uh, had had a respiratory infection, uh, probably aspergillus, aspergillosis, but it was necessary for legal reasons apart from anything else for me to confirm this. The bird incidentally is in poor um, condition, the plumage is damaged, which was all relevant to the particular case. So the gross post-mortem examination very quickly confirmed that that was indeed the likely cause of death. 
I mean, quite apart from the discoloration, the uh, note here, the swelling and the rounding of the surface of the liver and the mottling appearance. This was a liver that was grossly overweight. Um, uh, there's heart up there, of course. Uh, here is caseous material. This is just a mat of mycelium, fungal uh, mycelium, uh, occupying the thoracic air sacs, etc. And then, of course, um, histopathological examination. Uh, using a variety of stains, but this um, uh, illustrates the, the fungal hyphae in the air sac walls very, very nicely. You can see these, of course, are septate uh, fungal hyphae, and they have um, infiltrated that wall completely uh, in that section. So that is a sort of routine use of, of pathology, to, in this case to confirm a diagnosis. Um, and, um, uh, but nevertheless, the combination of the gross post-mortem exa examination um, and the, um, the follow-up histopathology and other tests as appropriate is an important contribution by the veterinary pathologist. Pathology, pathological examination can also be uh, crucial in apparently intractable, um, uh, undiagnosed cases. Uh, here, for example, at post-mortem, but it had a long clinical history, is a Barbary falcon. A Barbary falcon that had had an ulcerating lesion on the medial aspect of the thigh for months. Various veterinarians had looked at this, they'd taken swabs, they'd grown various bacteria, they'd done sensitivities, they'd treated with antibiotics, etc., etc., etc. No one had ever done cytology or histology. When it came to me for post-mortem examination, I took out a small piece of the tissue and lo and behold, it was a squamous cell carcinoma. Now, this would have been diagnosed many months before if at least the pathologist's thinking had been brought to bear on the case, even if it wasn't a, a proper pathologist. And I think it illustrates how uh, one wants to bring in this input, particularly when dealing with very valuable birds such as this. But pathology is also very important, as I've said before, in health monitoring. Diagnosis is one thing, but I'm interested, and we should all be interested, in monitoring the health of apparently healthy populations, whether they be in a zoo, in a captive breeding program, a rehabilitation center, or in the wild, because there is often background information that we can use and which may be relevant uh, to uh, preventive medicine or diagnosis of disease on a future occasion. And in the case of, of uh, free living birds and captive breeding programs, that underlying background pathology may be relevant to the species success. So for example, during the course of routine examination of tissues of raptors that had died of natural causes, sometimes traumatic injuries, whatever, um, I would pick up and one would pick up um, uh, lesions which are probably of no significance per se, but could be under other circumstances. So here, for example, in a European kestrel, we've got a, uh, an abscess, one of a number in the, in the liver with quite a marked giant cell um, reaction here and a very thin fibrous capsule and lots of uh, necrotic material in the center. We never did work out what the etiology of this was, but nevertheless, it was a feature in a number of birds in this captive uh, collection. Likewise, in this case, in, in a laughing falcon, um, quite a marked uh, granulocytic interstitial nephritis. This is kidney, of course, with glomeruli and so on, and there is this um, quite diffuse infiltrate. No evidence in life of clinical disease, although we didn't uh, check uric acid levels and so on. Uh, the bird died of something entirely different but uh, nevertheless useful to have this information and part of our database for investigating problems in the future. And just the third example, unexplained hemosiderin deposits in the liver of another species of falcon, a feature that we saw in several others, possibly related to iron storage disease, the sort of thing we see in starlings and miners and so on, but we don't really know. And this sort of information, I would argue, with raptors is as important, if not more so, than just the straightforward diagnosis. Building up a database of background pathology and indeed background normality that we can refer to later on. Now, pathological investigations have, over the past 20 or 30 years, um, helped to clarify many clinical problems in raptors. With the hundreds of years of interest in birds of prey, in captivity, and, in, and more recently in the wild, many disease syndromes have been recognized, and quite a number of them. Uh, there's been very, uh, there was until recently very little input by pathologists, and so very often the pathogenesis, the underlying pathogenesis, wasn't properly understood. 
One example is, is given here. Sinusitis is a common clinical problem in birds of prey, particularly in falcons, and it's a, a fairly uh, difficult condition to treat. Certainly chronic cases, repeated use of what appear to be the right anti, um, uh, antibiotic agents, etc., very frequently um, fails to uh, produce a, a, a cure. A section here, a decalcified section through the sinus of one such case that succumbed to something else, but nevertheless it had a long history of sinusitis, illustrates a sinus, and you can see how there is just a build-up of necrotic material here within the sinus. And on special stains, we were able to demonstrate a variety of different species. So it's only a, s a small example, but it illustrates how pathology can help the clinician in understanding why his or her therapy is perhaps not as uh, satisfactory as it might be. Another example, I was interested in why it was that certain intramuscular injections um, into, into raptors uh, tended to um, impair flight, and certainly in falconers' birds, they flew less well. It all seemed quite straightforward that it was probably causing some irritation or damage, but it was only when we actually did some histological studies on biopsies and post-mortem material of pectoral muscles that we realized the extent to which the needle tract here had actually produced, um, or where the needle had gone, had produced the tract of necrosis, myofibrillar degeneration, etc., down here, uh, inflammatory cell infiltration, and a certain amount of necrosis. And that's just from one intramuscular injection. And I think it's important that the pathologist working with these species makes this information available to clinicians and to biologists and so on to illustrate the importance of pathology under these circumstances. And then another example, there's a genus of nematode worms, worms called Serratospiculum, which live in the air sacs of birds of prey. Uh, particularly, but not exclusively, in tropical and subtropical countries. Um, we, for a long time, many of us said these are of no significance clinically. We find them on laparoscopy. We find their eggs in feces, etc. But in recent years, the combination of clinicians' um, observations and our own studies on these worms, and you can see some, probably the same one in cross-section with the characteristic eggs here, studies on these have indicated that they can cause uh, damage, they can cause um, a squamous metaplasia of the air sac walls, for example. Um, uh, bacteria can then colonize. There's a cluster of bacteria there. And we are now in little doubt that these worms can predispose to an air sacculitis possibly to a spurgulosis, and undoubtedly to a decline, to a reduction in performance in terms of, of respiration and, uh, and, and flight and so on when, when the lesions are, are severe and undoubtedly precipitate, um, in some cases, terminal respiratory infection. Now, one of the uh, historical claims um, that... Um, uh, I was able uh, to investigate using pathology um, uh, w w was one that was prevalent in the 60s in the days of pesticides and so on when a lot of post-mortem examinations of raptors were done by non-veterinary people and certainly not by, by pathologists. And because of the concern about um, uh, the decline in birds of prey, uh, it was said and indeed published that a no large number of these birds of prey were dying of encephalitis. And they were basing this uh, description of encephalitis on these areas of hemorrhage that you can see here in these two bisected skulls. Now, of course, we recognize, and a histological section of one of those skulls illustrates, that these are just intraosseous hemorrhages. These are agonal. This is um, going back to the, the last slide. Um, Will it go back? <laughs> I hope so. No. Um, that these are agonal ones. This is quite a normal terminal um, uh, condition. But uh, they were described at that time by people with no knowledge of pathology as being indicative of an encephalitis and suggesting that these uh, birds um, had either an infectious disease or perhaps that pesticides were causing this. It was very, very common, this belief, but it was pathology that was able to refute um, that, that particular claim. Another example of where we've been able to use pathology to throw light on the um, morbidity and mortality of a species of bird of prey relates to the European merlin. The European merlin is declining in numbers. It's doing far less well than its North American counterpart. And um, this prompted about 10 years ago an input by veterinary pathologists to try and ascertain why these uh, birds were declining in numbers. And this included a study of morbidity and mortality in captive merlins. 
Uh, this um, was a survey of 35 Merlins that we carried out, and you'll see a number of diagnoses listed here. Uh, the one I want to pay uh, particular attention to is not the no diagnosis, interesting though those are, <laughs> and they always uh, intrigue me, but the second one, fatty liver kidney syndrome. Um, eight of the birds that we examined out of the 35 had this syndrome, and it had not previously been reported. It certainly hadn't been reported as such. Others who'd done post-mortem examinations had seen this, what they described as a white deposit on the livers of the, of the, uh, of the liver and sometimes the kidney of Merlins, and I'm afraid to say had reported this as visceral gout. They hadn't taken any sections, they hadn't even done a touch preparation of the surface of the liver to see if there were urates or whatever there. Um, in fact, um, we, have, we were able to, to look at this in some detail, both the liver lesions and the kidney lesions, which you can see here. I mean, the kidneys are yellow in this particular case, but that's a certain amount of post-mortem discoloration, but almost completely white in the same way as the liver was. And we were able to investigate this condition that seemed uh, to be prevalent in captive Merlins. We thought it might be relevant to their failure not only to survive, but in some cases those that did survive uh, to breed successfully. And our investigations um, confirmed that this was indeed very prevalent in captive Merlins and might possibly occur in free living ones. Our first step, of course, as always with a new species, was to familiarize, uh, familiarize ourselves with the normal appearance, in this case of liver, a low power and uh, a higher power of liver, and then to relate that, of course, to the, um, the, the changes in one of the affected Merlins. And here you can see these well-defined areas of vacuolation of hepatocytes, which on specific fat stains were um, uh, hepatocytes absolutely packed with lipid. We remain uncertain as to what the cause of this is. The condition still occurs, um, but we are at least aware of it now, and studies are in progress. We think it's probably a metabolic condition, perhaps associated with feeding in captivity, but nevertheless, it's an important, um, uh, very important to us, and we think very important to this particular species. But without a veterinary pathology input, we would know far less about it. Now, a very important disease of raptors in captivity which again has attracted interest, attention from um, pathologists um, over the past few years, is the disease of bumblefoot, pododermatitis. This is particularly prevalent in full coniform birds of prey. Here's a falcon, which shows not only the typical planter uh, lesion here with a scab and uh, some hyperemia, some oozing of pus, I think, down here, but also a small lesion on one of the other digital pads there. It does also occur, although less frequently in owls, this is a European tawny owl, but this uh, demonstrates very nicely the, the, the raised hard scab. It also illustrates, incidentally, how talons can penetrate the soul and in some cases um, introduce the organisms that are so uh, important in this particular disease. Now, bumblefoot in birds of prey is characterized by a pus-filled soul, necrosis, the scab scab formation that you can see there, and also very often by cardinal signs of inflammation. Acute cases will be hot and swollen and hyperemic and painful. Um, it's not, however, I don't need to tell you, a new disease. Um, Simon Latham, in 1615, writing in England, not only recognized the disease, but advised his readers how to treat it. You must have your hawk well and easily cast, and with a sharp knife, search and pare out the pin or core and so dress it thrice in the week, and withal let her sit very soft and warm, and this will cure her out of all doubt. So a well-recognized disease, um, but of course he might have been good at treating it, but was not familiar uh, w w w with the actual underlying cause of it, etc. The pathologist's role, as I saw it, when I became involved with this disease, um, was to um, uh, learn about the, the pathogenesis, yes, the etiology, yes, and this involved the examination of material from live cases. Clinicians were operating on these birds and taking biopsy material, and also, of course, post-mortem material, whether or not the, um, the foot lesions were in any way related to death. So here, for example, 
We have some excised material, um, which was uh, taken um, surgically and was cultured. First, you've got scab on the surface here, and this is the lesion underneath. This is the same thing, just half on either side. Um, this um, this yield, yielded, as so many cases do, a pure culture of coagulase positive Staphylococcus aureus. And then, um, following that, we were able to carry out our histology. Um, there was a need to relate the histopathology of um, of these uh, to the normal structure, and as is uh, again the case, as with the Merlins and their livers, it needed a certain amount of study of the normal appearance. This is the normal appearance you can see of the foot of, um, of a bird of prey. Uh, you can see that there's a thick layer of keratin, well-formed keratin in this section, a fairly thick epithelium, and a well-vascularized uh, dermis here. And if we look at the other important aspect of the normal foot, and that's these papillae. The papillae are very characteristic on the, uh, on the planter uh, surface of, of, um, of the feet of, of birds of prey. And the basic structure is the same as I've just described. But the changes, and in some cases the disappearance of these papillae, is very often an early clinical sign that there is uh, foot abrasion uh, and that that uh, bird may well may be developing bumblefoot. Now, when the epithelium is breached in these cases, uh, then um, there's a possibility for bacteria, which are, we believe, the primary cause of bumblefoot, to enter. So here, for example, we have a junctional area of relatively normal uh, foot epithelium up here, and then suddenly it takes off, and there's obviously been a breach here. There's no overlying um, uh, keratin and epithelium, and in instead we've got a scab forming here, tissue damage, some of it because the scab is so hard, and of course an ideal portal of entry for bacteria. And uh, we've got another example here, another junction, norm relatively normal epithelium, keratin, dermis down there, rather dilated blood vessels perhaps, and once again junctional area through which uh, bacteria can enter. And this sort of uh, damage, uh, providing a portal of entry, we believe can follow the puncturing of the sole, um, an abrasive surface that the bird is standing on, perhaps nutritional deficiencies, etc. And the primary pathogen is usually Staphylococcus aureus, but very often uh, a secondary infection, one can have a mixed, um, a mixed uh, growth of organisms, a mixed culture of organisms. The, um, when you have a severe infection, then you get a build-up of material, as you can see here. Much of this is keratin, scab, etc., layers of, of, of keratin here, but much of this is just a mixture of blood clot, keratin, um, degenerate cells, etc. And this, of course, and, and bacteria can sit on the surface, um, and this, of course, causes physical trauma as well. Every time the bird stands on it, then it, um, it gets further bruising, further tissue damage, and yet again, organisms are able to gain access. And this is a close-up of that sort of lesion, really just a mixture of blood clot. These will be um, erythrocytes, there are probably some fibroblasts uh, infiltrating here, etc. And this material is very easily um, uh, infected by organisms, and Staph aureus is commonly found on the feet of captive birds of prey, although we have some doubts as to whether it's a feature of free-living ones. Our surveys in Europe have suggested they acquire Staph aureus when they come into captivity, and that perhaps these uh, Staphylococci are of human origin rather than being avian ones, but that uh, still needs to be confirmed. Right, so um, you get this build-up of material, you get, um, which I've shown, keratin, fibroblasts, blood clot, etc. Further damage appears, further organism, secondary infection gets in, and ultimately not only the soft tissues of the foot, but the tendons may become involved, the bones, the joints, etc., and one can have an ascending infection, which is essentially a staphylococcosis, but very often other organisms involved as well. Now, we were able to study these sort of cases on biopsies primarily taken by, or, or excised surgical material taken by practitioners. But these, by definition, tended to be the more chronic ones when all the initial therapy, antibiotics, and so on had, had, had failed to resolve the problem. I was interested in the question of the early infection and what was happening there. And this was difficult to study um, because of the inaccessibility of material. And so after, ca after careful consideration, we decided to use an animal model for this, another species. 
we chose what you call the European starling, or sorry, what the Americans call the European starling, um, our yeah, European starling. Um, for this, these were laboratory bred and maintained birds, which we knew were susceptible to staphylococcal infection, staphylococcal pododermatitis quite naturally, but they did provide an opportunity for some experimental work and we were able to study the, the changes that occurred in early cases. Uh, here is an example of a starling that has had a, a culture of Staph aureus inoculated into, into this pad, not into that one. So that's the swollen one. And then we studied the development of lesions over the subsequent seven days in order to ascertain how rapidly there was a cellular response, how active heterophils were in phagocytosis and that sort of thing. It enabled us, as I say, to study these early acute lesions. Here is one such lesion, the overlying uh, epithelium, epidermis, and, and keratin here. And here is a very early lesion. This is a 24-hour one uh, with a focus of, of necrosis here, a lot of edema, and a very marked um, inflammatory cell, predominantly heterophil infiltrate. And concurrent with this, as in clinical cases in birds of prey, there is a heterophilia, um, a marked leukocytosis, and the predominant um, um, white cell is, is the heterophil there. And uh, so we were able to study the, the, the development of the abscess, the cellular response, etc. And indeed, um, and such things as fibroplasia, within 96 hours, fibroblasts were being laid down, etc., and effectively walling this off. And then we were able to progress to the somewhat more chronic, but we're still talking in terms of just a few days, lesions. And we were here able to make use also of transmission electron microscopy um, because uh, we were interested in the extent to which histiocytes, and most of these are histiocytes here, a granulocyte down in the bottom right, um, histiocytes and fibroblasts were part of the more chronic reaction in this particular case. Now, as a result of the studies, both in the birds of prey and in the, in the starling, we were able to uh, explain to clinicians uh, uh, a lot about the, uh, the significance of, of bumblefoot lesions and in particular to relate it to the anatomy of the, of the foot of the bird of prey and explain why lesions, particular lesions, might affect tendons or bone or whatever. In other words, apply our, uh, what we found on pathology to the clinical features of, of the particular case. And this in turn um, enabled us to give some guidance on treatment. Uh, here you see surgery on a bumblefoot case being, um, being carried out. The bird has been anaesthetized, of course, and the, um, uh, the, the, the scab with surrounding epithelium following cleaning and so on is just being uh, removed. And you can see, in this case, not caseous uh, pus, but fairly liquid pus full of bacteria underneath. I should say, for example, I should say that this is a modern version of what Simon Latham was describing nearly 400 years ago. The only difference was he had no anaesthetics, and I suspect that his hygiene was not quite as uh, conscientious as ours, but it's essentially uh, the same technique as was as would described by him. Now, bumblefoot was not the only uh, disease that was recognized long ago um, in falconry literature. And the last part of this um, lecture uh, relates to um, one aspect of that. And I refer here to the work that was carried out, uh, or the publication, in 1486. This is the first um, printed publication in the English language relating to falcons and falconry. It was published in 1486 under the name of the Book of St. Albans, and it was attributed, and almost certainly was written by a lady called Dame Juliana Burns. And she described many diseases of, she described falconry and heraldry, but also described many diseases of trained falcons. And here, I won't read the whole thing, it's difficult, but you can see such words as feathers and plumage, uh, the description here is, and feathers again down here, the description here is of feather abnormalities and how these impaired the flight of falcons that were being used in falconry. And she described a number of these conditions and how they could be recognized and possibly treated. Now, uh, the, the, the whole question of feather abnormalities in birds of prey is a, a field that's, that's ripe for investigation. We recognize many feather abnormalities in birds of prey here, for example, is one in an owl where the, um, the feather has become pinched out and been dropped prematurely. You can see the vascular sheath there. You can see some little um, keratin hunger traces, fret marks in the feather. 
we recognize these very uh, frequently in birds of prey. Here's another one where this is another owl actually, but in this case something has gone wrong and the vascular sheath has just perpetuated and the, the barbs and the barbules have, have not emerged at all. So we recognize these co two conditions. If we relate the paucity of information that we have about feather abnormalities in raptors to the uh, tremendous uh, research that's been done, the dramatic research results of the past 10 years insofar as citizen birds are concerned, particularly virus-related virus work, citizen beak and feather disease, polyoma, etc., it is surprising that comparable work hasn't been done in birds of prey. And I think there's a, a need for uh, avian pathologists to start looking at these because flight is so important to these birds and feather abnormalities uh, can impair that. Um, in my view, uh, examination of feathers should be a routine part of raptor work, both clinical and pathological, and indeed it can be uh, a key part of health monitoring of, of, of free living birds of prey. In Africa, for example, um, our, here we have um, a feather uh, uh, being examined under a dissecting microscope, and we've been able to use the examination of dropped feathers from roosts of birds of prey as part of our health monitoring program. And then we can subject these feathers. These are just collected from underneath, underneath, underneath the roosts. They're examined in the lab, and there's a range of lab tests, cultures, and um, submission for hev heavy metal analysis and that sort of thing that can be done very easily. And of course, feathers can be easily transported, they're light in weight, uh, easily packed up, etc., etc. So that's the sort of thing that we would be doing in Africa in terms of looking at feathers and trying to learn from those feathers, get information that gives us some insight into the health of, in this case, roosts of birds of prey. But back in London, a lot of our work on feathers has been in uh, using um, uh, uh, electron microscopy, scanning electron microscopy, um, partly uh, prompted because of a general interest in, in feather pathology, but also because of the need, and I come back to my question of forensic pathology, the need so often to be able to distinguish different feather damage in birds of prey when it comes to legal cases. So for example here, this is a straightforward fret mark or hunger trace in an owl's feather. You've got the barbs down here, and this um, fret mark, this um, line of weakness, is something that's recognized by all those who work with birds. It's not just seen in raptors. But very little work has been done on the, on the pathogenesis of this, and so we started off with fret marks with our scanning electron microscopy to have a look at different magnifications to see what was happening. And this confirmed, as is now common knowledge, that these are areas of poor keratin formation, and they correspond usually to a plane of low nutrition or sometimes other stressors such as hypothermia and so on at some stage in, in, in the bird's development. Uh, so the feather that you saw earlier was collected in Africa and the scanning electron microscopy was done in London. Likewise, Here's a gunshot case, an African one. This is a serpent eagle with, um, uh, with uh, an injury here due to uh, a, a presumed gunshot wound. The, the, the gunshot wasn't found um, but, uh, and wasn't visible on, on radiography, but um, the scanning electron microscopy shows a quite characteristic uh, damage here to the barbs and barbules, which is sufficiently near to being pathognomonic that we can use it in a court case and distinguish it from other, um, from other causes of feather damage, which may also um, be part of the differential diagnosis or, again, may be a legal case. Here, for example, is another legal case, a raptor case, in which electrocution was implicated, and these are quite characteristic changes in, in the barbs here, the barbs and barbules associated with electrocution. So we are using scanning electron microscopy as a tool to um, throw light on these feather abnormalities, and we've also been doing some transmission electron microscopy on feather follicles and so on, which I don't have time to, uh, to cover today. So pathologists do have an important contribution to make um, uh, to work on birds of prey, um, and I think it's important that this con continues. There's a need to increase the, the, the pathologist's input because, um, first of all, captive birds of prey are living much longer in captivity, and as they become more sedentary, uh, perhaps more inbred than they develop the various diseases that we associate with old age and unnatural diets and so on. So here in this eagle's heart, for example, we've got um, atheromatous plaques, very clear, um, clearly defined uh, yellow raised atheromatous plaques in the heart of this, uh, of this particular bird. 
and also we're seeing as these birds live longer more neoplasms. Here, for example, we have an adenocarcinoma, or rather metastases of an adenocarcinoma in the liver of a, of a European buzzard, um, and we're seeing more and more of these. And um, we have now have over 100 cases of neoplasms in raptors that we've been collating over the past year. Uh, a year ago, we had fewer than 20, but it's quite obvious that more of these are being detected, diagnosed, etc. And of course, the need for pathological work, pathology and pathological investigations on free living birds continues to be important. I mentioned earlier the Mauritius kestrel. 25 years ago, this was the world's rarest bird of prey, possibly the world's rarest bird. And there were estimated to be far fewer than 20, possibly fewer than 10 of them left on the island of Mauritius. This month, Jersey Wildlife Preservation Trust, which I mentioned earlier and their work, um, was able to announce that there are now over 500 Mauritius kestrels left uh, remaining, and many of these, the majority of these, are in the wild on Mauritius. Uh, this species has been saved from extinction um, as a result of a combination of habitat management and captive breeding, not only at Jersey and many other countries of the world, including North America, uh, Canada and, and the United States. And there has been a very important input in this project over that 25 years by pathologists. Health monitoring and pathological investigation when birds have died have been part of the study for all of that time. So I do think that that one example illustrates how important it is for the veterinary pathologist to become much more involved in these various programs relating to birds of prey. It is important to remember that raptor work is very much a multidisciplinary subject. Uh, we have here our free living raptors, our captive raptors. We have a lot of movement between one population and the other, more and more as a result of controlled release, casualty birds coming into captivity, that sort of thing. We have an input by various disciplines. We've got veterinarians, toxicologists, geneticists, nutritionists, and various other disciplines contribute more specifically either to free living or captive birds. It is quite, quite clear that the pathologist maybe as part of the veterinary heading here, uh, has an equally important and in some cases more important part to play in that, um, in, in that sort of work. So the veterinary pathologist can play a part in promoting the health of these birds, in diagnosing disease, and in so doing we could perhaps heed yet another bit of history when Richard Bloom, again writing 300 years ago about falconry and the diseases of hawks, said, diseases are easier prevented than cured. Everyone, therefore, that intends to keep hawks should be well advised in the first place how to preserve them from sickness and maladies, which is of greater concern than to cure them when distempered. That is a very laudable aim, and I would suggest that the veterinary pathologist has a large part to play in achieving it.